Side Hustle Show 301, Accelerate Your Business with Outsourcing, Best Practices from Hiring Over 300 Freelancers. What's up, what's up, Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because you can't do it all on your own. At a certain point, you reach the ceiling of your own capabilities, of your own capacities, and no amount of productivity hacks are going to get you to the next level. So what do you do? You hire some help. And for most of us, that help is going to be virtual, as in the person isn't going to work from our home or office. They're going to work remotely. Traditionally, this has been called outsourcing, but I think we're in the middle of a shift where it's really just becoming sourcing. Where and how can I source the best people for the job so I can focus my time on the stuff that only I can do? Now, a lot of guests have mentioned their virtual assistants or their team members almost in passing, but it's been a long time since we've done an episode dedicated to hiring those VAs. I've done a fair amount of hiring or sourcing myself over the years, but it's nothing compared to today's guest. Bonnie Fay has hired over 300 freelancers, many of them to work for and help grow a real estate consulting business that she ran. So I invited her on the show to see what best practices she's picked up over the years. How do you figure out what to hire for? Can you spot a top performer during the application process? What sites does she like to hire from? What are the red flags to look for? Stay tuned for all that and more in this episode. Notes and links plus a free PDF highlight reel with all of Bonnie's top tips from the call are at sidehustlenation.com slash Bonnie. Today, Bonnie runs livemoreformula.com where she teaches other entrepreneurs the skills of hiring. She's learned from her years in the outsourcing trenches, which I think is a great example of turning what really began as an ancillary skill into an income stream of its own. Now, if you're ready to step up your skills, I encourage you to check out our sponsor, Skillshare.com. The online, on-demand learning community now has more than 20,000 classes in marketing, business, social media, and tons more, all taught by industry experts and insiders. Practice just-in-time learning by picking the ones that are going to make the greatest impact on your bottom line. Visit Skillshare.com slash side hustle for two months of unlimited access for just 99 cents. Once again, that deal for Side Hustle Show listeners is at Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle. This edition of the Side Hustle Show is also brought to you by FreshBooks. I rely on FreshBooks when I need to send an invoice to clients or to advertisers, and I know I'm just scratching the surface of what the award-winning cloud accounting software can do, but know this, more than 10 million customers trust FreshBooks to keep their admin and paperwork in check, and 97% of small business owners, myself included, would recommend it to a friend. Visit freshbooks.com slash side hustle to start your 30-day completely free trial today with no credit card required. That's freshbooks.com slash side hustle and enter the side hustle show in the how did you hear about us section. We begin this call with some of Bonnie's first hires, which she called disastrous. That's when she discovered what she calls hybrid sourcing and found an experienced project manager, Lisa, who was able to bring order to her outsourced chaos. Ready? Let's do it. The first few people I hired were just terrible. I didn't even think I realized they were terrible because I was just so excited to have a team. So it wasn't until I actually started hybrid sourcing, which meaning I hired people both domestically and abroad, that I was able to scale my business and quadruple our income in just three months. And that's because I had someone on my team who was a senior project manager at AT AT&T, and she was lucky enough for me, retired, and she had managed multi-million dollar projects. And what she did is she took all the outsourced workers and she did what most people don't do with their outsourced workers, which is she systematized everything into a process that helped us generate cash on an ongoing basis. Well, that's super helpful. Was she just a pro bono volunteer for you or how did that work? Kind of felt like it. She told me how much she made when she worked at at and and it was not anywhere near what she was working for me for. I'll tell you because I don't think she would care, but she started working for me for $15 an hour. And I think she just felt bad for me. I mean, she was retired. (laughs) And the tip that's helpful for your audience, right? One of the most amazing things about hiring virtual workers is really taking advantage of talent pools that other people might not be accessing, like Lisa, who was incredibly smart, incredibly capable, and had already achieved incredible things for one of the biggest companies out there, but who was retired. So she sees me and she's like, I got to help this girl. Yeah, $15 an hour is fine. 
how do you end up connecting with her? I found her on Upwork, actually. Really? Okay, well. I wouldn't recommend that for people to go to today for that type of person or even for American VAs. But at the time, that's where I found her. So my general rule when it comes time to hire is when the pain of inaction becomes too great. And so I'm curious, were you at that pain or were you like, look, this is the only way to actually make a real go at this business? That was exactly it. Yeah. You nailed it. (laughs) What were the roles that you brought on board for? At this point, I've hired pretty much everything you can imagine. So I've hired out virtual assistants, both domestically and abroad, graphic design, video editing, anything I could then resell to the company. We hired out uh, pay-per-click. At the time, it was Google AdWords. Today's market, it would be more Facebook stuff. What were the first hires? The first hires in consulting business, it was all about scaling the directories project. So we were submitting this particular company, which was our largest client, into a multitude of online directories. And it was really, I want to say boring and tedious work, but something that was really valuable to them because it basically gave them a lot of backlinks. It got them all over the internet really fast. So it, it had a lot of value, but it was data entry. It was glorified data entry. Yeah. And it was something you were doing yourself at the time. I never did it myself. I did different projects for them, but this became an opportunity to generate ongoing revenue. And I don't know about you, Nick, but data entry makes me want to do mean things to myself. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't think I could ever do it, but I was able to find a team that could do it. And then Lisa managed it all and systematized it all and processed it all. And it was a good twist of fate. So it sounds like you were bringing people on for a specific project that had extra revenue tied to it. It wasn't like, okay, I'm going to be making the same amount with the added expense of personnel, but I need this to be able to offer this new service. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's turned into over the years hiring for everything because I'm still outsourcing 90% of our business. Like I don't do much in our business except for perform and learn and market. Those are my primary roles. So the first hires didn't work out so well. Why do you think that was, or with the benefit of hindsight, (laughs) I'm curious to get a peek into your hiring process now. So I want to pretend we're giving the game of future smart Bonnie gives past Bonnie advice, which is what you're saying. So (laughs) I think what I did is I just put up a job ad and I was like, yep, the right people are going to, you know, come. And then I didn't put it on many websites. (laughs) I didn't put it on the right websites. I didn't know how to filter people. And then I spent time interviewing them. And that was a waste of time. (laughs) Why do you say that was a waste of time? Interviews for me are filled with false positives. I find that what most really, really smart entrepreneurs could be doing better to improve their hiring process is to not interview before you do a test project. I like to relate it to this, right? Let's imagine that we are on an online dating website, right? And we meet the most perfect woman, Sarah. Sarah, what's up? Oh, my God. And we're like, oh, God, like, this is the person who I'm going to marry because I know because she's got an amazing profile. And then we spend a 45-minute conversation with Sarah. Maybe we have two conversations. So we're like, Sarah, what would it be like to date? Okay. And then after that, we're like, Sarah seems perfect. Sarah, do you want to move in for the next year? I know we haven't even met each other yet or even gone out on any dates, but you seem wonderful. That's the modern day equivalent of our hiring process is we base so much in these theoretical conversations called interviews where we're testing for the wrong skill sets, right? So to get more specific into your question, right, why are interviews bad is because interviews test for people who are great at presenting. And it also tests for someone's belief in themselves, which is filled with cognitive dissonance, meaning some people who are incredibly talented are going to underrate themselves. And some people who are not quite talented yet think they're the bomb.com. So you're testing for someone's (laughs) self-esteem and you're also testing for how well they present. And this really comes down to the difference between being a great talker or being a great doer. And often the people who are the best talkers are not the best doers because they're the idea people. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, yeah. typically. The best doers might be incredibly introverted, really shy. They're not going to necessarily charm your pants off, so to speak, but they might be the best person for the job and they're not going to necessarily shine in that interview. So interviewing before you work with someone, for me, feels like the equivalent of seeing a really hot girl on a dating website, having a quick 45 minute conversation with Sarah, so to speak, and being like, Sarah, want to move in for the next year? There's no wonder why 90% of hires are mishired. The whole process is not realistic for today's times. So what do you do instead? It's really a few step process. And it begins with really defining what you want and need. So it's important to get crystal clear on what is the job role. Once you're really clear on that, then it comes to the job ad. And so you're going to want to remember that. Well, let's pause there. Let's say, okay, well, how do I get crystal clear on the job role that I need? It seems easy or easier if I'm the solopreneur doing all the work myself and I kind of itemize out the tasks that I'm doing and say, okay, this is stuff that somebody else could reasonably take off my plate. But what if it's a skill or a task that you're not currently doing? I'm curious what your process is like for documenting those roles that you need. What I do when I'm looking in the define stage is often I just look at where am I spending my time on an ongoing basis? So what are the t- tasks that I'm doing on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis where we could take those things off my plate. And it sounds like you're talking about, if I'm understanding you correctly, is like opportunity analysis of things I'm not yet doing. And I think that's smart, but I don't, that's not necessarily where I would recommend people begin their hiring process, just because there tends to be more of an ROI with replacing yourself in your business with things that are you know, taking you away from your higher dollar per hour activities and just taking okay. low dollar per hour activities off your plate. So this process would be really taking a time inventory of where is your time going and then getting clear on what are the low dollar per hour activities if you're not clear on what those types of tasks are and then seeing, okay, where can I take some things off my plate so I could refill that with more sales and marketing. So you can kind of get an idea of your hourly rate or what your equivalent hourly rate might be over the course of a month or something and say, okay, this is a task that I don't need to be doing, or somebody else could take that and run with that for much less than what I should be making or what I would typically make. A friend presented what she called the rule of two, where if it was her second time doing a certain task that she probably had no business doing, that was the red flag, right? Where she would create the process documentation and hire for it, or either, you know, assign to an existing team member or say, look, I don't need to do this anymore. Like I'm getting it off my plate. And I thought that was a good rule. Can I add something to that? Go for it. For people who are more process oriented, I think that's beautiful. But for some of your listeners who are extremely creative entrepreneurs, making a process or a system is going to feel like torture for them. It's going to make them feel as though they're never going to hire anyone because a lot of really smart people are saying who are more process oriented are saying, just make the process or the system. So then they never end up hiring because they think they need to have all these processes and systems in place. What I've done as a workaround for that, I have the virtual assistants make the process with me. So I might explain it to them on Skype and then they document it and they turn it into a system. And that works a lot better for me because just tedious tasks. Like I can't, I can't really do it. I'm too ADD for it. Tell me a little bit more about how that works, especially for creative work. Cause like if you're outsourcing design or something like that, it's so subjective, even outsourcing podcast editing. It's like, you know, what to keep, what to cut. Like it's really subjective. It's hard to kind of processize it. The best thing you can do is a few things. It's about trying before you buy, right? We didn't go through our, my exact hiring process. If you want, we can return to it later, but it's making sure that part of your process is as early as possible, filtering for people who are really good already without spending any time interviewing them. And then going on a couple project dates with multiple people. Some people call them test tasks, but doing a multiple of them to really see who wows you from the beginning and who seems to operate really well without any of your instructions. Ideally with creative work, you shouldn't have to be giving them micromanagey types of instructions. Of course, there's always revisions, right? Duh. Like no one's perfect, right? And it's a collaborative process. But with my creative people, they're driving it. They're doing things I wouldn't even have thought of. And I think it's about making sure that you do your due diligence and not being so 
I'm not talking about you at all, Nick, but I'm just saying I know a lot of entrepreneurs are really impatient and they're just like, I just got to get the person. I'm not going to do this with four people. Well, if you're not, then you're going to suffer with bad creative work because you need to do it with a couple people. Just like, you know, I love to say that hiring is a lot like dating. And if you just were like, I'm just going out with Sarah, I'm not going out with four people. And well, if you don't like Sarah, then that's your own fault. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I really like that concept of going out on project dates. Do you pay people for those dates? Do you, I mean, do you, do you buy them dinner or do you say, Hey, this, this is part of your interview process? It depends. So here's some guidelines for your audience about when they should pay for the project dates and when they might not. If okay. You've got hundreds of applicants for a position and it's in really high demand and you're looking through your Google filter form, which I'm going to tell you about more later, I hope. And you're looking at these people and they've already answered these hypothetical questions really well. And you're like, wow, I can really see that this person's great. Or you're looking through the portfolios and you're like, wow, these portfolios are really great. And you're like 20 or 30 of them could potentially be a fit or at least 10. Then you are less likely to have to pay. And you can be really honest with the candidates about that because okay. you're not going to miss out on much if somebody says no. Now, if you're in a situation where you're dealing with someone who's really low income, everybody's $5 an hour, I think it's very polite to pay for the project dates. It's not going to be very expensive. Sure. It means a lot more to them. So that's a good reason to do it. And if you're in a situation where you've got five applicants who seem like rock stars, but the rest are duds, you might consider either bartering with them or paying them for a fixed rate project and say that I'm going to pay you for this, but this is going to be a courtesy. <laughs> like it's an interview project. And the purpose of this project, Nick, is for us to get to know each other better right? So it's really important when you're doing this, not to turn people off with your test project or your project date. If you make it seem like you're just testing them so they're good enough, you're going to turn off your best people. So here's what you can do. Start with understanding that this is a collaboration where two really talented people are working together and respect them and say, listen, I know that this has to be a fit for you as much as it has to be a fit for me. If you're really bored or disengaged, it's not going to be a fit for you. And therefore, it's not going to be a fit for me. So this interview project is an opportunity for us to get to know each other and see what it would be really like to, to work together. And okay. through this process, we'll see if it is a win-win. So we've kind of done our time audit. We've identified our low dollar per hour activities and then we skip to these project dates. I think we skipped a step in the middle of writing the job ad, the job description. Hey, where am I sourcing these people? So we've written a job ad that's like really compelling. It's really sexy. It's talking about why you're an incredible company to work for, what the perks are. So our top performers are getting attracted in that job advertisement. They're getting emotionally hooked in. They're like, oh my God, Nick Loper seems like the best person to work for ever. I'm so excited. I'm going to take the time it takes to fill out a filtering form. So the next step is having a Google form or a filter form, which is not uncommon in the industry at this point, but most people who are really smart aren't doing them right. And what I see most really smart, often very successful entrepreneurs doing wrong in their hiring process is they ask either too many questions on the filtering form or they don't ask questions that gauge the candidate's skill set in advance. I'll give you some examples of really famous entrepreneurs who asked questions that weren't helpful. What makes you want to work for us? That tests enthusiasm. Which Prada bag would you be if you were working for us and why? What's your spirit animal? What do you like about this role? Sorry, th these are good questions or bad questions? Terrible questions. I just am not naming <laughs> okay. who said them. Everyone would know. Okay. So just saying that these are very smart people whose teams got a little misguided with the hiring process and need to listen to this podcast. And so those aren't good questions. Those questions primarily test enthusiasm of the candidate. And you could have someone who is incredibly enthusiastic for to work with you but does not have the skills or the aptitude to do the job. So what you should do instead is try before you buy. So put them in situations where you're giving them hypothetical situations that they might actually be in and ask two to three questions at the most, but I would recommend two. And you ask questions that would be challenging. So an example, if it's 401 and we have a thousand attendees signed up for our webinar and at the last minute, Bonnie's audio stops working and the videos start to loop unexpectedly, even though everything has been tested in advance, 
What are five things you would do immediately to salvage sales, calm down the attendees, and fix the technical problems? And that would be a great question for a virtual assistant because in that situation, there's no amount of training that they could have that would save all that. I mean, actually, there is, <laughs> but, but you would okay. want someone, ideally, who could figure out things on their own that wouldn't need that level of training because they're just a smart person and they're a problem solver. That's the kind of person you want to hire is someone who's an excellent problem solver, who can think on their feet, who's not going to come to you for every little thing and say, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Help me. Like, no, like think for yourself and find people in advance who can think for themselves and only go to the people who give you really good specific answers to those types of questions. And if it's something creative, okay. look at their portfolio is basically the, is the thing to do. Where do you like to post your jobs? You mentioned Upwork before, and then you kind of added now primarily for overseas candidates. Where else? I'm going to give you the sites and I'm going to say that it's really important for people to know how to filter and do all the steps I told them before and get decently good at it before they go onto the sites. A lot of people's bad experiences come from going to Upwork or going to onlinejobs.ph or going to Facebook groups, not having the right steps and assuming that just going to the right place places will work. So that's thing number one. But in terms of logistically where you can go, Craigslist is awesome for the US, even though I know it has a bad rap. It's where I found all my rock stars and Facebook groups can be good. It's really important to get a multitude of sites. It's hard to find the top 5% of the workforce if you're not playing the numbers game effectively. So you're going to want to post on indeed.com, post on Craigslist, post on Craigslist in a few different cities, maybe post in cities that are a little bit lower income, but have high quality people because they're going to be a lot less expensive than cities like New York. So think of places like San Diego is less expensive than New York, Denver, Boise, Idaho. Those are some great Craigslist places to be in. Okay, interesting. And because it's a virtual position, it doesn't matter. Because it, it's a virtual position, it doesn't matter, you know. And so it does vary a lot for each individual role. Like Los Angeles is excellent for writers, like any kind of writer. LA is your place. But it, it just depends. And then in terms of the virtual overseas people, I would say onlinejobs.ph has been good for us. The Facebook group that are geared towards Filipino virtual assistants have been excellent. And we just sometimes upwork, but like honestly, less and less these days. So just posting on a multitude of places is really important. What's your take on sites like Hire My Mom for domestic VAs? I mean, so I never was able to use that site. <laughs> I kept going to it and I kept getting confused by their old interface. And I was like, I don't understand how to log in. Yeah. So some friends like swear by it. And I think it's an interesting concept. I mean, that's awesome. I think that it's never about the place so much as the process is really how I feel about it. Like, let's go back to our dating metaphor, right? Like you can meet the love of your life anywhere. You could meet the love of your life in a bar. You could meet them at a friend's party. It's more about who you're show showing up as, as you, right? How are you attracting that person? And then what's your, your process for identifying who's going to be a great person for you? And not a okay. great person for somebody else, you know, and that's, that's a bit of a process. So casting a wide net on a bunch of different hiring sites and places, asking some challenging questions, uh, real life scenarios in the filtering form, and then doing the project dates, the test dates. Then do you go to an interview, like a Skype interview, or do you just say, hey, look, I trust you at this point. <laughs> You're hired. I like to get on the phone with people a lot of the times before I do an interview project, just to show them that I care about them. You could replace that step if you had a lot of candidates or if you were extremely famous with a personal video you sent out. Again, it just depends on the number of really good people you have. So I like to get on the phone and just talk to them quickly to get a sense of them. And then I do the interview projects. And yeah, I mean, if it's going good and you've done multiple interview projects with someone, they typically, one of the things that is really clear to me after hiring over 300 people is that classic saying, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And the signs that someone is not a top performer will be evident very quickly. And so you're going to see almost immediately someone didn't follow instructions. Well, they should be out, right? You're going to sure. see someone who took more than 24 hours to respond to you. They should be out. How they're showing up early on in the job process is often a really strong indicator of what kind of person they're going to be 
with you longer term. And that's been the thing that's become most clear to me after doing so much hiring is look at the signs that come up early and understand that a lot of the things you might be thinking are yellow flags often red flags in the beginning. <laughs> okay. You're like, I'm willing to look past that. Don't, don't look past that. Yeah. You can give someone a little bit of a chance, but remember you're looking for someone who's going to be the top 5% of the workforce. So if they're not wowing you in the beginning and leaving you with that, that excitement where you're like, Oh my God, they just added my podcast so much better than I ever could. Oh, this is great. If you're not feeling yeah. like that in the beginning, like they're not your person, you know, like there's certain things you're going to have to train for, right? Like if it's customer service or like, how do you deal with my specific clients? Okay. Yeah, sure. But there's a certain sense of wow that you should feel with any top performer. And if you're not having that emotional feeling, they're not it. Because t the definition of a top performer is someone who exceeds expectations. So if they're not doing that in the beginning, they're not going to do it later. Have there been any common factors, like looking back now over these 300 hires to say, okay, this person ended up being a rock star? In terms of what things people should look for? Yeah, early on, you know, green flags, so to speak. Green flags are, I would say, a sense of agreeability. So look for people who say yes more often than no. People who, when you come to them with an idea, they're like, mm -mm, no, we can't do that. Look for someone who's like, okay, that seems a bit challenging. Here's some of the constraints, but yeah, I think that could be possible. Or here's how we could do that. Or let me think about how that might be possible and come back to you, right? A sense of agreeability is really important for team dynamics. Another thing is being conscientious, high conscientiousness, which is classically part of the ocean personality definition, but basically that comes down to having a sense of pride in who they are. So people who are high conscientious tend to do the best in their health, in their careers, and in their romantic relationships. And the reason for that is they really feel as though their identity is tied to being a top performer. So Someone who has like a very well-balanced life or seems really put together, extremely organized, extremely proactive, someone who seems invested in the work very early on. Those are all some good signs. And then also just looking really, really, really diligently at those project dates and saying, okay, again, like, am I wowed? If I'm not, this isn't my person. If this is sounding like a lot of work to do this entire recruiting process, I'm curious if you've ever gone through any of these pre-vetted marketplaces that are like, oh, we only hire the top 3% already. Like we've done the filtering for you. FreeUp is a new one or, or some of like the US virtual assistant companies like Time, et cetera, or Belay. Do you ever hire through those services? Okay. So you're saying it sounds like this is a lot of work. Can I just go to someone who will filter for me and just get someone to hand me the person? So I never use those services personally because in, in the past when I have it's never been the same level of person for the same price. So I'm not saying that there's not great virtual assistant services out there. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that you need to expect to pay a premium for that. So typically, a virtual was one of the most popular ones at a time, and they paid their yeah. people between 11 and $14 an hour. And then they never charged you less than I think $20 was their lowest, but it was between 20 and 30. So you're getting an $11 an hour person, but you're paying between like 20 and $30 an hour. And that dynamic wow. has never worked well for me. And that's the game you're playing when you're going to a virtual assistant staffing company is they have to pay their people less and usually dramatically less in order to be profitable. And that's never worked sure, for sure. me on a longer term basis. But for some people, that's going to be a fit, you know, and if, if it is, you know, go on with your bad self. For me, having someone who takes up so much weight off of my shoulders and is a perfect fit for me is such a reward that it makes it all worth it. And also, I think one of the benefits of doing it the way we do is that you find the person who's the perfect fit for you and you don't have to go through a matchmaking model. So what do you mean by hybrid sourcing? Hybrid sourcing is really about getting the best of both worlds. What a lot of people talk about in the world of online marketing and what a lot of people, I would say, stretch the truth on is that virtual assistants in the Philippines can handle everything in your business, right? Or 
whatever. That's just not true. There's certain tasks that people who are overseas just won't be able to do as well as Americans. And if you don't understand what those tasks are, you're going to set yourself up for a lot of frustration. But that doesn't mean that people overseas or in the Philippines specifically can't be excellent at so many tasks and you can get an incredible price differential that'll really make a huge difference in your business. But what I've found works the best is having an American virtual assistant really guiding the process. And then you use selective help overseas to do a lot of the day-to-day operations. And that's where you get the advantage of both worlds because, you know, hiring five people in the States might not be something you can do, but you could potentially hire, you know, one person in the States and three people in the Philippines, and you'll get so much more work done in so many different areas of your business. And you'll be paying for those three people, maybe what you would have paid for one or half of one here. What kind of budgets are you seeing today, both domestic and abroad? I am hearing about people who hire people in the 2 to $3 an hour range occasionally in the Philippines. Some of my students are doing that. And that's based on like a full-time hire? Yeah, but that's for a very like, I would say like very entry-level virtual assistant who has a very limited skill set. I know a woman who's paying that much right now and she's a photographer and she is basically creating an Instagram system where she likes and comments on people's photos and she's using people at that level to kind of do that. Do people like feel taken advantage of at that rate or they're like, hey, that's a decent salary? I don't think it's a good rate. I'm just telling you it's out there. <laughs> I don't okay. think it's a okay. good rate. Yeah. I think in terms of a guideline for your peeps, it's it's really about remembering that you are paying a fraction of the cost, but never thinking that if you pay a certain range, it's going to always be okay. So just like the doctor makes more here than the trash man, if you're dealing with a project manager in the Philippines, I mean, they could be 10 to $14 an hour. Heck, they might even be 20, but they won't be 50 to 70 you know, which is what you would pay here. So it's like, it's always remembering, like uh, the more skilled they get, the more they can fairly command. And you shouldn't, you know, whether you're hiring in the US or you're hiring abroad, you should always remember that the fact that their cost of living is so much less, right? For me, I have video editors who I pay anywhere from $5 an hour in the Philippines up to $20 an hour. And the $20 an hour person is incredible. If she was living in the United States, my guess is she would have to command a much, much, much higher level to support herself. And she she would charge maybe 100 I don't know. But it's always about remembering that the higher skilled person always has to charge more. It doesn't mean that you can't get great people in the U.S. who are $15 an hour. But it does mean that if you're looking for someone who has five years of infusion soft experience and knows Entreport and knows active campaigns and has managed, you know, huge projects, like they're going to have to charge more for all those skills. And that's fair. Yeah, that makes sense. So $15 and up for domestic help and, you know, sounds like $3 and up for, for international help be a, a ballpark place to start. Yeah. So I would say like for me, five to $9 an hour is like my range. Most of my virtual assistants in the Philippines are between four and six. Okay. And I know this question is going to come up, but I'm curious how you address like, okay, is this an employee or is this a contractor for international hires? I think it's more straightforward. Like I'm just hiring this service, but I'm curious for the domestic people that you run in payroll? Are they 1099 contractors? How does all the, the tax and legal stuff work? I mean, I think people need to like talk to their lawyers about this to get the specifics, you know, and just be really honed in on it. But here's a couple guiding principles of what you should do. So I'm not a lawyer and I'm not giving legal advice, but <laughs> you're going to want to make sure that you never call them an employee or that you say that you're their boss. Calling someone like your employee is just one very illegal thing to do. You also can't technically tell them when they have to work. So what I do with my team members is I say, 
hey, like, I love working with you and I would love to work with you on Mondays between 12 to 3. If you're up for that, what that does is it gives you, you know, regular hours, which is awesome. Should we need to change that at any point? That's fine. But like, that's what would work really well for me. Would that work well for you? Okay, interesting. And a lot of people become virtual assistants for the hourly flexibility. Like, I can do this work whenever I need to. I'm a client, so I would tell people that I prefer if they work during the same hours as me. And as a client, yeah. I can choose people who would do that. And when I find out people are working at all hours of the night to do the work, I usually fire them because to me, that means that their brain is probably not fully working. You know, like my, <laughs> my brain doesn't work that well at two and three in the morning. So this is a kind of a more complicated question. Yes, you need to 1099 them. You have to be careful not to call them employees. You also like can't set their hours. Those are some of the few basic things. But Beyond that, just talk to your lawyer. Well, Bonnie, this is good stuff. We're always looking at smarter ways to grow and scale and add to the team because there's a, a natural ceiling to how much you can get done on your own. If you want to check out some more stuff from Bonnie, visit GetSourceIt.com. She's the founder of SourceIt training course for just the stuff we're talking about, hiring and uh, managing a virtual team. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for side hustle nation doesn't have to be hiring related just you know whatever entrepreneurial wisdom you'd like to impart let's keep with hiring since that's what we've been talking about i would say the number one tip is really just to understand that if you have resistance to hiring someone that that is so normal and not to beat yourself up about procrastinating over it or feeling like you should have done them a really long time ago and even feeling uncomfortable with the process is all really normal. But just remember that when you stay stuck in the pain, it's really hard to move forward with anything in life. So as long as you're focusing on the reasons not to do something, you'll never move forward. Instead, focus on the benefits of really how your life will be different once you have the time, once you're not constantly multitasking, once you're in a, a state of flow and a state of your own genius zone a lot of the time, how are you going to feel when you have more time to show up for the people who you love the most in the world more regularly? How are you going to operate in the world when you're less scattered, when you're more focused and clear? You're going to be a different person at that time. And everything that you're currently resisting is going to feel really silly because when you have an incredible talent around you, everything in life and end in your business becomes so much easier. It's like upgrading who you are. So I would invite people to just move through the resistance and be gentle with themselves if they have it and just say, Hey, that's normal. And I've got this. You've got this. I like it, Bonnie. Thanks so much for joining me and we'll catch up with you soon. There's no question Bonnie has picked up a ton of different skills from closing client deals to hiring virtual assistants like we talked about to creating and selling online courses, but it's not like she was born knowing how to do this stuff. And that's where today's sponsor Skillshare.com comes in because everything is learnable. On Skillshare, you can learn all that stuff and more and still practice just in time learning, which is to say to pick up the skills you need when you need them. The on-demand online education platform has more than 20,000 classes taught by practicing experts. It's the perfect resource for professionals who want to advance their career and for side hustlers who want to expand the skills you need to grow your business. Skillshare is like Netflix. You get unlimited access to all these classes for a low monthly price, meaning you never have to pay per class again. And unlike Netflix, I think it'll actually help your business. Check out the extensive catalog for yourself at Skillshare.com slash side hustle. And while you're there, you'll notice that Skillshare has put together a special offer for Side Hustle Show listeners where you can try Skillshare for two months for just 99 cents. I think you're going to love it. Go to Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle to get started today. That's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle for two months of unlimited access for just 99 cents. All right, my top three takeaways from this call with Bonnie. Number one is to use the filter form idea to ask hypothetical interview questions before scheduling an interview. I really liked Bonnie's framework here and the practice of asking questions that put candidates in a potential real life scenario in your business. In her case, it was the webinar software is freaking out a minute before airtime. What do you do? I thought that was an interesting way to screen candidates 
and probably faster than my traditional method, which has been uh, to kind of go through the applications, similar, cast a wide net, similar to Bonnie, and then assign everybody who replies a letter grade, A, B, C, D, F, based on first impressions of their profile and their cover letter. I like that filter form uh, method. That was takeaway number one. Number two is to go on test dates. I know we used the dating metaphor a lot in this call, but I think it makes a lot of sense. So start out with a small project that's indicative of the future role and see how people perform. You're probably going to learn a lot more from that than you are from an interview. And even if you pay a few people to do the test tasks, I think you're still going to come out ahead. It'll still be a lot cheaper than making the wrong hire and then finding out a few months later. Takeaway number three is to do a time audit. This is something that I've done several times in the past and I'm definitely overdue to do again. So how a time audit works is you basically track everything you do during the day to see where your hours really go, like start time, stop time, what you were working on. It can be a really eye-opening exercise, both from the standpoint of getting an honest look at your productivity and maybe your true hourly wage, but also from the standpoint of what could be delegated. I think you'll also find it kind of gamifies your your productivity in a sense too, because you're like, I'm on the clock, I got to get this stuff done. You might find a bunch of items on your timesheet that really aren't things that demand your specific expertise. Maybe somebody else could do those better, faster, cheaper. That's definitely been my experience in delegating certain tasks. And usually it falls into one of three categories. It's stuff that I can do but shouldn't be doing. Maybe that's, you know, the easy repetitive tasks where there's just a comfort level in doing it myself. Category two would be stuff I can do but maybe not as well as somebody else. Maybe that's podcast editing or making graphics for the blog. And then category three is kind of the hardest and stuff that maybe doesn't show up on your timesheet as often. It's stuff that I can't do, but needs to get done. It's that next level, move things forward in your business stuff, oftentimes tech related in my case, but you know, that's going to vary for, for each person. As far as the tools to get this tracking done, I mainly just use Excel. You could use just pen and paper if you wanted to, but toggle, T-O-G-G-L.com is a tool that's been mentioned in the past. And the app A Time Logger was recommended on the show in the past, I think, by Steve Scott. So the A Time Logger app, I'll link both of those up in the show notes for you, sidehustlenation.com slash Bonnie. But what do you think? Inspired to start delegating, to start working on your business instead of in it? I know this is an area where there's always room for improvement for me, especially as the business grows and the time seems to shrink. But once again, notes and links for this one, plus the free PDF highlight reel with all of Bonnie's top tips from the call are at sidehustlenation.com slash Bonnie. And that's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of The Side Hustle Show. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to The Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 